Allah is forgiving. Allah is merciful. You know, once the Prophet ﷺ saw a woman who had lost her child, and he was, he was ready to find And then she saw the child, he found her child, and she picked the child up and hugged the child, hugged it close. And Rasulullah then pointed to her and said to the Sahaba, Ataruna, هذه طارحة الولدها في النار. Do you think that she will throw, she could ever throw her child into the fire? And they said, no, she wouldn't. And then Rasulullah said to the Sahaba, Allah arhamu bi ibadihi min hadihi bi waladiha. That Allah is more merciful and more kind and more affectionate than this mother could ever be to her child. That Allah is to her, to his slave, he said. But we have to be, to be deserving of this rahmah, we have to be slaves, we have to become slaves. We have to become true slaves. We have to become true worshippers, true servants of Allah. When this happens, then Allah's mercy will pour on us. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Malik Yawm Al-Din Iyyaka Na'bud Wa Iyyaka Nasta'in Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim Sirat Al-Ladina An'amta Alayhim Ghayri Al-Maghubi Alayhim Walam Wallin Amen Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to lecture number 11 in this series in which we are pondering the words and verses of the Quran in order to enhance pious cognition and righteous conduct. Last week, we continued the discussion on the meanings of the two words in the Basmalah. Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. And in that discussion, there were seven salient points to keep in mind, which I will, as usual, uh, quickly summarize. Point number one was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls our attention to observe the traces of His mercy, the, the, the effects of His compassion and His mercy in the world, within ourselves, uh, all around us. And, and this is in Surah al -Rum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ آثَارِ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ This is Surah Al-Rum verse uh, 50. Al-Rum, the 30th Surah. So observe the effects of the mercy of Allah. How He gives life to the earth after its lifelessness. كَيْفَ يُحْيِي الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ لَمُحْيِي الْمَوْتَىٰ That indeed the same one will give life to the dead. And he is over. Who are ala kulli shayin qadir? And he is over all things competent. So observe the effects of the mercy. Look at the traces of Allah's compassion, His mercy, and you will see them everywhere. You will see them as we are told in again in Surah Al-A'raf, verse one fifty-seven. Wa rahmati wasi'at kulli shay. And my mercy covers everything from the highest heaven downwards, as we said, uh, the universe, the heavens, the kursi, and then the arsh. And above that, it's written, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ That my, my, my mercy has, uh, encompasses everything. Point number two is that Allah's mercy envelops us from all directions. It reaches us from, uh, in the macro scale, in, in the micro scale, as in the first moments of life, in the womb. His mercy also extends in the macro scale in the of the universe and beyond. In both of these, 
we find environments hostile to life. And yet we are protected. Protection from the dangers of space are granted to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the protected roof, the protected ceiling, as he says in Surah Al-Anbiya, Sa'fam Mahfuda, as we are told in, in Surah Al-Anbiya here. وَجَعَلْنَا السَّمَاءَ سَقَفًا مَحْفُوظًا وَهُمْ عَنْ عَيَاتِهَا بَعْضُونَ And we have made the sky a protected ceiling, but they from its signs are turning away. And in this regard, we listed several meanings of this verse and the meanings of the, of the two words, uh, uh, the word of sama and the word of um, uh, uh, saqf. Uh, uh, sama meanings and everything that uh, that covers you. كُلُّ مَا عَلَاكَ فَأَضَلَّكَ Everything above you and, cover, and that covers you is sama. And the meaning of saqf is roof, a roof over you, a ghita, a cover. And when you put these two together, you can see how it's protecting. The protection is from radiation, extreme temperature, etc. And, and, and saqfum mahfuda being a, a ceiling, a cover. And the fact that ours is the only planet we know with a protective atmosphere, the, an atmosphere that protects life from the harmful aspects of space, is clear evidence that life on this planet has special favors. If Allah did not provide this saqfum mahfuda, this protection, as he says in the Quran, in the form of an atmosphere, then we would all freeze to death. The oceans would boil over and we would be left in darkness with no oxygen to breathe. And so the point, therefore, was that just as Allah's rahmah, his mercy, reached us in the first moments of life in the hostile environment of the human body, which has an immune system that isolates and attacks and destroys any foreign bodies in it. Um, but yet the womb from which the name Allah has created, a, a caring nature of Rahim, a mother's womb, which is named after Allah's name Ar-Rahman. It's Rahmah also reaches out. Just as it reaches there, it also reaches out into the other harsh environment of space to save our home, to save this planet with, protective, with a protected roof over our heads. وَجَعَلْنَا السَّمَاءَ سَقَفًا مَحْفُوظًا Point number three was focused on the concluding part of this hadith, um, which we read uh, after reminding us of the link between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessed name, Ar-Rahman, who said, that I am the I am the Ar-Rahman, I am the compassionate, the merciful, and I and I created the womb and I derived the name for it from my own name. After that, he goes on to draw our attention to the secret of human affectionate connections. All our connections that are of love and affection, the secret behind that, he's saying that the secret of every action, every act of compassion between two living creatures is linked to this, to my mercy, and a secret that stands stark, in stark contrast, of course, to the individualism of our modern times, or in modern parlance, in, the, in contrast to the selfish gene narrative and, um, that we've so come accustomed to hearing. In, in Hadith Qudsi, we are told that that, uh, that whoever maintains these links, I will maintain the link. Point number four was that the more we engage with the meanings of the words of the Quran, the more profound the effects of our understanding and connection with Allah. This is a sila, this is a connection that goes right back to, to Allah. And, I've, and I, in this regard, I mentioned last week that I had conducted um, the priming uh, board association experiments in the 1990s while doing my PhD um, on people who were uh, on Arabic speakers and English speakers um, on the meaning of, the, of this word and the meaning of the word Rahim and its equivalent in, in English, the womb. And uh, when we use the word, there are distinct galaxies. When we, whenever we use a word, it, it's not only that word that gets activated in the mind. There's a whole galaxy of other meanings that are, that are connected to it or that are also um, partially uh, activated. They partially come to mind. But, and you can trace this with experiments. You can, you can identify what sort of uh, semantic galaxy a word is um, functioning in. And 
what we found was that these semantic galaxies revolve around streams of thought along specific pathways of meaning that guide the direction and the flow of our thoughts. And in, and in that, they influence our memory activations in, in two broad categories um, for the two groups of speakers, for English speakers and for Arabic speakers. One was episodic and the other was, was heavily semantic. Now, point number five was that ishtiqaq, the derivational system in Arabic, plays a significant role in meaning formation. The roots of the triliteral or the um, dual roots are, are well, four or five. And these roots form uh, meaning. And the triliteral, these roots, they maintain patterns of meaning through various layers. And given that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is confirming that he did istiqaq, he derived the name for the name of the womb from his own name, then this is significant. And more on this later. We, it, this, is, this is a subject that worth pondering, and this is what we'll be looking at today. And point number six was that we share something profound in our heart and our soul, not only with each other, not only with other human beings, but we share this mercy that has been revealed and distributed among among the jinn, among the human beings, among the insects and among, and among the animals. We share something profound with insects and with unknown, with unseen creatures. There are connections of affection across the divides of tribes and across the divides of species. So the Prophet said, Inna lillahi rahmatin, that, that Allah has a hundred, uh, divided the, the mercy and compassion into a hundred parts and revealed to, to the earth just one. And it is with that one. And this is the sentence, Fabiha. He repeats this, uh, this word, like, and with it, and with it, and with it. That with this, with this one mercy, does every uh, every wild beast show compassion to its young? It is this that causes the bird to fly hundreds of times to his nest, to, to the nest to feed her young. And for when you see a parent's heart ache for the suffering of their child, it is Allah's mercy that is acting that is acting on the heart to create that. So, and this means that any act of compassion, kindness, affection between any two living creatures can be traced back to that fraction of compassion of Allah, which is distributed, as we said, Point number seven was that the first place where this pure compassion, this pure mercy first manifests for us human beings is in the parent-child relation. Um, the parental instinct is one of the most powerful forces in nature. And here I reminded you of my own story that when my son was born, how it, it transformed my sense of value for my life. And indeed, it, it, was, it is exactly the same for every parent. When you first lay eye on your child, you realize that the value for your own life has now become subordinate to the life, to the value for the life of that child. If the doctor says the child needs a kidney, you will be willing to give. And I told you to ponder the um, lifeboat experiment, the lifeboat take the, that if there's one seat on the lifeboat, the parents will always say, save my child, save my child, because the value is subordinate to their own value. The value of that life, is uh, life of the child is subordinate to the life, uh, their own life. And this is because of that mercy. This is because Allah, uh, captures the heart of the parent to such a degree. And, if, and for those of you who want to um, study this in more depth, I have, uh, I think, the, 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 nearly 40 lectures on, on this subject in particular. It's called the Parent-Child Relations. It's, it's on YouTube, um, on Dharamox. You, you, you can um, view those, those lectures um, where I go into this in, in depth. Um, and the point here is that to recognize that this is from Allah because um, there are exceptions where it doesn't happen. They think there are times when it doesn't happen. So recognizing and acting in accordance with the gift of compassion as a divine imperative. And if you don't recognize that and failure to act on the compassionate manner is to be robbed of this divine gift that Allah has given us. And we, we know this from also not only from experience, but also in hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was seen once 
by a, a Bedouin Arab who came and saw him kissing his grandson. And he said, oh, do you, do you kiss your children? That I have 10, I never kiss them. Because they saw that as a sign of macho, um, uh, manly uh, behavior where you don't show these sorts of emotion. And in response, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, that's uh, our amliku. What can I do for you? What can I do for you if Allah has taken out the rahmah, taken out that mercy from your heart? If, if Allah has robbed you, if Allah has decided that you are not going to have it, and then this is natural, this happens, Allah gives us lots of things, and He deprives it in certain cases to show you what happens when you decide. And we see this from time to time. You know, people have babies and they put them in shoebox and leave them on the side of the road. And that can happen. That can happen. So, so, so it is not intrinsic. It is not. It is not a, a human thing. But if Allah gives you, but and He He does. But the exception is also there. Some people are born with sight, and some people are born without. So that you 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 value things when you know that it can be. You can lose it. Right. So that was the revision from last week. Now today, I want to take a closer look at the concept of istiqaq in Arabic, which was mentioned in the hadith, so which we started the discussion, which is the key. This is the key hadith. Whenever you're discussing Ar-Rahman in, in tafsir, the, the, the meaning of Ar-Rahman, this is the first hadith because it is Allah who is saying, I'm Ar-Rahman, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm the merciful one, I'm, I'm Ar-Rahman. So, um, what? And, and, and so this is a, a, a key. Now, there are two reasons why I believe it is pertinent for our purpose to um, ponder and reflect on ishtiqaq, which is the Arabic derivation system. First, uh, of course, is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirms in his own words, hadith in hadith could see that he does ishtiqaq, that he did ishtiqaq, he derived the name. And if Allah is doing something, then there must be great wisdom and great and immense benefit in it. But also the second reason is that the massive influence we've discovered through research that istiqaq has on the semantics of the Arabic language and the me in meaning generation. Word meanings in Arabic are interlaced and interconnected via the process of istiqaq, this istiqaq. And as I mentioned last week, I, I conducted uh, some psycholinguistic experiments during the PhD um, to test the semantic spread of this word. Um, and it's equivalent uh, in, uh, uh, which is womb in our in English. Um, uh, rahim is the word that he derived. Um, and to test this in, in Arabic speakers and English speakers. Now, I have a slide. That's rahim, okay. Um, is it clear there? Right. Now, that here, what we have here in this slide, you'll see to show the interconnections between the Arabic istiqaq derivation. Now, if you notice here that most of the words are linked phonologically. So in the mind, that's what we've, we have. And the raha meme then becomes, you know, the word rahim is linked through these three letters, raha meme, and then from that you have ar-Rahman, rahim, silat ar-Rahim, rahma And then at the higher levels, it, it connects to the name of Allah. And that is the spread in the minds of people. This is how it works. Um, this is how it appears to be presented in the mind of Arabic speakers. And you can see in, in the next slide, um, we have some, huh? okay. Yeah, we have some uh, 17 words. Rahama, uh, to have mercy. Rahama, to, um, to say, may God have mercy on you. Tarahama, to plead for God's mercy. Tarahama, to show the understanding of for another. Istarhama, to ask for uh, ask someone to have mercy, and then rahim of course, boom ar rahim uh, the beneficent is tarhama to plea for for mercy marhama pity rahman rahma rahma rahum marhum deceased rahim. So the point here is to show the the linkages of the root in all these different words, and these are just. Basic words, you can you can then develop. They, they have a whole. Each word can then be um, listed out in a in the in the sort in the morphology for each one. You'll get then another forty-five 
different words for, can be attached to them. Right. So, and an important point to note here is that the word rahim is a concrete word. It's not an abstract word. This is some, this is a concrete thing. This is uh, it, 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 it's not like the word um, love or mercy, um, where 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 it's an abstraction. So there there should there could be differences. Um, and yet the differences between the semantic and the English uh, speakers and the Arabic speakers is, is stark. And the main reason for this is arguably due to the feature of uh, Arabic language known as ishtiqaq. Um, uh, had it not been for this feature, th these connections would not exist in the mind of Arabic speakers. Um, that's the assumption. Now we know this because when we compare the results of speakers of English with, with equivalent with this equivalent word, this concrete word, um, we do not get the same semantic spread. Here, here's the knowledge slide. Um, yeah, okay. So what you can see here is that in cluster A and B, these are the words that an Arab, that, that are linked to the word rahim in, in, in an Arab mind. Um, you have God, Allah, beneficent, the beneficent, the kind, merciful, love, family, sister, and mother and on the other side when you ask when you produce the word womb to english speakers you get words like hysterectomy blood illness hospital surgery uh, etc i've co covered one because i didn't see that it's uh, it means intimacy um uh, as you can see in arabic speakers are more likely to come up with words in cluster e and b english speakers in cluster c there's only there are only overlap in three words um, the, the words, um, yeah. um, these overlaps were, were, were the three words, a woman, baby, and bath. Uh, now, so w what we can see here, as you can see in, in the next slide, all the words used by um, speakers of English were morpho morphologically unrelated. Um, let me change. Yeah, th this is the morphology of this is the, if you trace where the words came from, this is what you get. Right, so what, what do we have? We have a Greek, the, there was only one word that linked um, in meaning, hysteria, but hysterectomy, the, the word hystera, hystera in, um, in Greek means womb, but when, uh, when it is compared with the etymology of the word womb, in English, there's no inherent similarities. The, the womb is, uh, in English, is derived only um, on Old English in the word womb um, and bears no orthographic or phonetic similarities to the Greek hysteria. Now, another finding was that English speakers were heavily influenced by episodic memories. And what does episodic? These are things that, that they have seen or they've heard or they've experienced the news items they might have seen or this sort of stuff. And the Arabic speakers were influenced by, by what, if you divide the memory, the one distinction, memory can be chopped up the, in, in many different ways. So if you divide memory into episodic and semantic, then you will find Arabic function, uh, our Arabs, people who are speaking Arabic, will tend to function more in the semantic field, in the semantic, mem with semantic memory, and English speakers will, will be more inclined to, to focus on and derive meaning from the episodic memory. Um, and of course, this has implications for how we as human beings chop up and categorize the world mentally and how we perceive the world around us. Now, what I found in this research was clear proof for what is generally referred to as linguistic relativity. Now, there's a, this is um, usually referred to as a Worfian um, theory or a Worfian notion. There are two notions of it. One is the hard notion where there's linguistic determinism and the linguistic relativity. So this is, um, I'm not arguing for linguistic determinism, but definitely uh, linguistic relativity here. The language one speaks does influence one's perception of the world around them. Obviously this was uh, 30 years ago um, in the 1990s when I did my PhD, um, and the research has moved on, especially since we now have access to more advanced tools for investigating phenomena of this sort. Now, research into the structural pathways of language in the brain have accelerated, and we now have detailed mapping for studies of the brain. Um, but before I go into that, I want to speak a bit about left and right 
hemisphere, left and right brain. You must have heard that. Some of you might you might have come across um, this uh, popular training courses called the uh, whole brain training, whole brain, whole brain teaching. And of course, this is based on some research and based on a lot of myth um, of lateralization of the hemispheres of the brain, um, the, what, one part of the brain and the other. And there's a stereotypical view of the brain, um, in, in, you see in this slide, um, which is, of course, not entirely accurate. Um, uh, a lot of it is, uh, is myth, but um, what, what the general idea is that the left brain um, has analysis, logic, facts, sequencing, mathematics, language, and on the right side, the right brain is creativity, intuition, feelings, uh, imagination, daydreaming, and arts, etc. Now, however, it is true, apart, set aside the, uh, the myths that are associated with this, um, it is true that uh, the left side of the brain is linked to the right side of the body, and vice versa. The right side of the body is linked to the left side of the brain. This, this, that's an established fact. And when it comes to language, there is also unanimous agreement that language pathways are located in the left hemisphere, whereas creativity uh, is perceived to be on the right side of the brain. This is, of course, not strictly so, but because the brain functions as far as uh, uh, in a uh, it, it, it's not exclusive, it's not exactly like that because the brain um, signals um, diffuse across the hemispheres, and some functions are associated with the left and right. But language is one of those who is, who, that is um, generally seen to be on the uh, a left side, uh, a left brain, left, left hemisphere function. And uh, there is also a, a super highway between the two hemispheres of the brain called the corpus callosum um, that connects the two sides of the brain. Um, and you get the best of both worlds, um, the, the creative right and the logical left, when both hemispheres synchronize via this corpus callosum, this uh, superhighway. When both sides of the brain are marshaled through this connection via the superhighway, um, we get results of learning, we get better results of learning and comprehension and creativity. That's, that, that's a general idea of understanding about the way the brain works. Now, in other words, when people engage the whole brain, when they use both hemispheres of the brain, there is a qualitative difference in performance. There is, uh, and there is a reasonable assumption. That this is one of the reasonable assumptions that scholars make. Now, to come back to the original research, which I did, I, um, as I said, in the 1990s, that um, there has been um, several um, lines of research that have confirmed the findings that I made earlier, these 30-year-old findings. And one area in particular, which I um, want to share with you tonight, Um, is an area where, where MRI was used, scanning, scanning technology, scanning the brains of people who are speaking Arabic and people who are speaking Indo-European language. There, th this research is now ongoing in comparison between uh, scanning people's brains and then comparing them. Um, so the latest one is, um, come up here, okay, yeah. So this was published in February last year, um, the title, The Native Language Differences in the structural connectome of the human brain, in which um, researchers at the Max Planck Institute in the, uh, for Human um, Cognitive and Brain Sciences, Department of uh, Neuropsychology in Leipzig in um, Germany, they recruited two groups of people, 47 Arabic speakers and 47 German speakers. And they made them, they put them on the um, various um, tasks, they give them a very variety of language tasks while their brain was being scanned. Now, before I tell you about the results of the study, keep in mind what we said about language in the brain, that the general consensus among psycholinguists is that the structural language connectome in the brain is located mostly in the left side of the brain. The pathways are well established, as you can see here in this slide, um, um, from which, this is from another study, um, and, and you can see very clearly here that we have the dorsal pathways 1 and 2 and ventral pathways 1 and 2 connecting to the primary audio, or auditory cortex, and this is all on the left side, right? 
Now, if you look at what happened when they compared the language functioning of Arabic speakers with German speakers in this latest research I've just shown you, and the one from Leipzig, the results were completely different. Uh, well, well, astonishing. Um, this is how they describe what they found. They said that the present study provides new insights into the brain adaptation for cognitive processes. That is, the structural language connectome in the brain is shaped by one's native language. Previous behavioral studies have reported cross-linguistic differences in multiple aspects concerning phonological, lexical, grammatical, and orthographic processing, etc. Each of these differences affected, for example, various brain activations during language processing, different aphasic system and stroke patients, and diverse structural basis for developmental dyslexia. The fundamental effects of cross-linguistic environments on brains of language learners should be reflected not only in differences in functional activity, but also in structural organization. That, that what we are talking here, that there's difference in the actual structure of the brain. There are structural differences. Using this graph uh, theoretic analysis of uh, the language structure, our results revealed significant differences in the language connectome. We are talking about the structure of the language, the uh, structure of the brain, between the native of the two speak of the two different languages. Native speakers of Arabic, a language that is driven by its roots, and I'm quoting here now, they're saying, native speakers of Arabic, a language that is driven by its root system, where most words are morphologically complex. They are morphologically complex. What do we mean by that? That you remember that first slide I showed you of the complex nature of, of, of the mixing? So you said that led to stronger network properties in semantic and phonological neural systems. The this finding is consistent with previous studies that found localized brain structural differences between groups of natives and suggests that, and this here is the big suggestion, it says that white matter plasticity in brain structures coincide white matter brain might might well white matter plasticity in brain in brain structure coincides with specific cognitive functions and the processing demands of lifelong use of particular languages so what it's saying is that the language the plasticity in the brain is affected by the use of certain language and now in this slide they they have some results here where you can see clearly the difference between um, the functioning of the Arabic and English. Um, what you're seeing here is the Arabic is not only functioning on the left side, but it's also crossing over to the right hemisphere, where, where the, German, the German speaker is, remains on the left. Um, and it will be much clearer in this next slide. So what you're seeing here on the right is that that colossal, that superhighway in the middle is, 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 is centralized and then there is spreading of activations that are going on both sides. The entire brain is being engaged in Arab, Arabic speakers for the same tasks. And that's the difference that with Indo-European, it's, it's not happening. So the stronger, and this is what they, they write about this, they said the stronger interhemispheric inter connection via the posterior corpus callosum also suggests a more complex integration and prosodic syntactic information during language processing in Arabic. This is because Arabic, it, it, this is because in Arabic, the pattern of consonants and vowels, which is the CV skeleton, uh, um, uh, are, uh, and, uh, as the abstract prosodic unit, is, is likely to contribute general syntactic information. The corpus callosum is the structural bridge that supports the hemispheric communication of the prosodic and the syntactic. Um, and uh, the complex integration of prosody and syntax. Do you know what prosody is? Prosody is the, um, the, the melody of the language, where the, the tune, the, the sound of the language, the tajweed of the language, um, that, that is what prosody is. And that comes from the right side, generally. Um, so what you have is a, the mixture of both. The, both things are the pitch, the loudness, the timbre, the, um, the quality of the sound. And so when a person says, um, you know, فَمَنْ وَصَلَهَا وَصَلْتُ فَمَنْ وَصَلَهَا وَصَلْتُ وَمَنْ قَطَعْهَا قَطَعْتُ That fluctuation of the sound, that is, that is prosody. And so the, the, the rhythm of the language, the sound, the melody of the language, that's all part of, the, that is usually on the right side, 
But what they're saying is that this is so interconnected that it's causing the entire brain to be affected, to, to, to come to, to, to work with, with, with it. So when, when, when we read, when we say, Ar-Rahman, Allama al-Qur'an, Khalaq al-Insan, Allama al-Bayan, al-Shamsu al-Qamar bi-Husban, that is possible. So, so what they found was that there was that there is complex integration of prosody and syntax. Syntax is the logical production of the language, where you're, you're the mathematical aspect of it. But then you have the the artistic aspect of it, the, that the, and they are interconnected. This is what they're saying. Is that they're saying that the integration of the pros, of prosody and syntax across the corpus callosum in the superhighway, engaging both hemispheres of the brain. Right now, with these findings in mind, stressing the fact that the derivational system in Arabic, which is ishtiqat, which is what we are talking about, ishtiqat seems to be the main reason for these particular patterns of mental functioning and the, the structural organization in the brain of speakers of Arabic. We, and the fact that we are striving to structure our cognitive capacities to, to bridge the gap of time and language um, that separates us from the first, first generation of interpreters, we need to have uh, some degree of understanding of what ishtiqaq is um, uh, uh, in order to, uh, and how it works. Yes, it is derivation, but what does it mean? What does ishtiqaq actually mean? And for that, um, I, uh, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to ishtiqaq in Arabic, um, crash course if you like, um, because ishtiqaq is at the heart of the matter. So, um, so what is derivation? Now, literally, um, it means creating a one word from another word and maintaining some characteristics of the first word through a link in meaning and other aspects of the word. You take one word and you create another word and there are links, uh, links involved. And depending on how many links, that will be the category that you, you, you will put it in. Now, in English, derivation is quite simple in Indo-European language because they are known as uh, um, concatenative language, which you, you build on and you can, you can continue building on. But Arabic is a non-concatenative language where it, it's, it's, it, it falls in. You, the, you, the inherited aspect are sprinkled in the word. It's, it's like sprinkling in. And this is what one of the um, people who studied Arabic or one of the linguists, he, he used the word sprinkled. That's why I'm using it. So. For English, um, you would get um, um, uh, the affixes. So what we have are prefixes and suffixes. Um, no? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Yeah. So what we have is that um, you, you would, in front of the word "just," you could put "un," and then that becomes "unjust," and then at the, at the end is the suffix is um, "justly," or you can be "unjustly." But notice that the original word remains the same. It does not. It does not change in all the permutations, and you, know, you could not stick an L in the middle, as, as I said, J U L T S Y. That would become Jalsti. It would lose the meaning immediately. As soon as you move it apart, you put something, you stick another word, another letter in between, the the meaning collapses. It loses the meaning as soon as it will break up the original structure, vanishes. One of the peculiarities of Arabic morphology is that it is not necessary for the string of consonants to maintain the basic root sequence. Um, order is fine, but sequence, um, even sequence, you, you, you do not need to maintain. The primary morpheme, which is the unit of meaning, um, is derived from the form, the actual forms. So in Arabic, infixing is the dominant process for mod. So we have prefix, suffix, and infix. So in Arabic, the dominant feature is infix. You're fixing inside. When, for instance, um, this one. Right, so here, here we have these three words, right? So we have rahamim separated by the letter wow in marhum. But it's, it has the meaning. There's a wow in the middle, if you can see marhum, the one who is shown mercy, marhum. This creates a difficulty in the um, disentangling of the stem morpheme in the mind. If you're, if you're working with this, you have to disentangle and the tarahama shows a human for understanding and marhum, which means disease, uh, plea. Now, this is, a, this is what is, they are referring to when they say that it has complex morphology. The, the complexity in the morphology is this, 
uh, if we use the, the, the dictionary definition for morphy, morphy is the smallest linguistic unit of form and meaning. Now, to a analyze this for uh, a person who, uh, what's going on, what, what has to be done, um, it, it takes uh, several layers of tasks. The first is that you have to identify the three basic root letters. So that's one level of, of work to do. The second is subtracting, subtracting the infixes and then reconstructing the stem in order to get the, the, the stay with the meaning. So you have three levels of processing has to happen here for that to happen. For, for it, it, so that's why it's complex. Now on the basis of what features and links mean to, uh, maintain um, with the first word, there are four categories of ishtiqaq in Arabic. Four. Yeah. So there are four. And note here that there are many ways to cut this cake. Um, lots of people, the other people may cut it in different ways, but this is the dominant one, um, the, the popular one, the one that m most uh, people take. Um, some people like to chop it up in different ways, but the categorization is that you have istiqaq al sagir istiqaq al kabir istiqaq al akbar and istiqaq al kubbar yeah. These are the four categories. So now, istiqaq al sagir what is the, 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 the first category of istiqaq? Which is the, um, uh, the, the simple or small istiqaq, although it's small, it's actually, the, in terms of content, it's responsible for the largest set of of, um, it, it's called Sagir small, but it, it accounts for the vast majority of the ishtiqaq in Arabic. And what you have here is that it maintains, from the first word, it maintains mean, uh, meaning, letters, and order. The meaning, letters, and order are there. So, ma'na, huruf, with tertib. That's, that's what it, and it, from this we have the ishtiqaq al-af'al, you know, all, um, for, for, for rahimah, when we say rahimah, rahimah, rahimu, rahimah, 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 rahim, all of that that you're learning now, that you, would uh, the the meaning is carried and the tartib the the actual original root letters and the and the sequencing is there and then there are the seven mashur al mustaqat al sabaa which is ism al fa'il ism al mushabba ism al maf'ul and lots of derivations can happen and this is the largest part type of derivation that, that that's happening in this um, so ar rahman rahim uh, 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 um, so that's simple, you, you, you are familiar with that. And this is the dominant form of ishtiqaq. Then we have uh, al ishtiqaq al kabir, which is also you take one word and build another word. But we spoke about this in the first lecture, um, in the first lecture of the series, if you remember, um, when, we, when we spoke about the root of the word. Tafsir. What did we say about the root of tafsir? Meant it maintains the meaning of uncovering and opening. Tafsir. Fassayu fassiru means to untain it. And afsara, afsara subh, that the opening, so if it's changed around, you get the same meaning. And then safara, uh, you travel, things open up to you. And, and firasa from opening as well. So, so if you switch them around, you get the same meaning. Now, another example is the root with the word, the root for the words Islam. That comes from um, seen, lamb, and meme. And you can find words in all six permutations. Um, and these are the words that, that they all, don't, irrespective of which order you put these root words, so these root letters, you will find words with the same meaning that, that, are car that are carrying the meaning. So in the first layout, seen, lamb, meme, salam means peace and comfort. And then if you put the meme in the middle, you, uh, salama, Samal, and then you will end up with softness in, in, in used in clothes. So you say samal for clothes, uh, a small amount of water as well. And if you put the meme in the beginning, well, we have the word masil. And masil is a place where water runs without obstruction. So there, there again, you, you have flow. And then if you put the meme, if you put the lamb in the middle with the amlas, it means opening a plane where, where nothing obstructs, where, uh, can obstruct a vision. That is amlas. And then if you put the lamb in the middle and the meme in the, uh, the lamb in the beginning and the meme in the middle, uh, lamasa, it's the stroke. And here, stroking um, uh, Ibn Jinni, the, 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 the great linguist who came up, who discovered this and wrote about it. This is his example I'm using. And he, his explanation for, for even for the verb lamasa, touch, he said it has to be a, a, a surface, a, 
to stroke a surface, it has to be plain and clean and soft and clear. The, the, the surface has to give you that affordance of, uh, of rubbing. That's why it's happened. And that's why also the, the word lamasa is used as a metonymy for um, intimacy and all, all other stuff because it, 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 it carries the meaning. And this, of course, uh, is um, with the root of Thulathi. Um, this is only three letters. But when it, it so you have um, six permutations, you can, you can change it around in, into six. But when it's four, when, it, when the root is four, then the permutations go up to 24. Um, no, 20, yeah, 24. If, if you have four, and, and you can change them in different... And then some, some roots in Arabic have five roots. So some words in Arabic have five roots. Khumasi. And for that, it goes up to 120. So you can find 120 words, you will be able to, if you search, you will find in those permutations, linkages. That's how it works. So that was the second category of ishtiqaq. And now the third category of ishtiqaq is ishtiqaq al-akbar, uh, ishtiqaq al-akbar, which is um, the, um, the bigger one. Um, yeah, yeah, this is akbar. Akbar. Now, this that you will see that there are two. It, it, you maintain that there's min kalimatain tanasul fil ma'ana. There's meaning. That there's, there's sharing of meaning and sharing of ba'dul huruf of some of the letters, not all the letters, some of the letters, and mostly the, the most of them are in the first two letters. And if you can see here now, what we have, we have the word hadala, which means to coo for a pigeon, and then we have hadara which means to roar as a lion. So it's, it's, it's animal sounds, that, that's the meaning it's carried through. And then we have salaba, which means to criticize, to run down, to slander, to defame. And then salama, and ma and ma are close to each other. So then you have to, to, to blunt, to make something jagged, to break it. And it also means to, um, to, to create a, an opening in a wall or to, to sully someone's reputation or their honor. So, it, so the meaning of salaba and salama you, you're getting. but what, here, there's an additional point to bear in mind. Um, did anyone notice the pattern here? Is that um, according to some scholars, the first two letters, the first two letters in the root are, are, are the foundations of meaning. And this is known as the thunaiyatul mu'jamah. al mu'jamiyah, thunaiyatul mu'jamiyah. The jewel in, in, in the dictionary, in, in um, lexicographic uh, analysis, that the first two, are what, are what we, the first two in the root, the first two letters in the root is what is important. Um, and we will come back to this because this has um, a lot of implications for our discussion. Remember we spoke about the Adamic language, the first language, the proto-human language. If you go back and start to analyze languages on the basis of this, then you will see the linkage with Arabic and, and the sources. I, I, I will talk about that later on, inshallah. So, now, the fourth category of ishtiqaq is what we touched on also earlier when we described the basmala. Do you remember that? What did we say? We said there's a shared meaning, but isolated letters from words and sentences from new words. So this is ishtiqaq al-kubbar. This is known as, and it's also known as nahd carving. Um, but, but what you have here, this is ishtiqaq. So when, when someone says that, Basmala or basmaltu, basmala, he said bismillah. So you, instead of taking one word and creating a word, you're taking a whole sentence and creating a word. So that's what this is, ishtiqaq al-kubbar. So the, the fact that he said bismillah, basmala. So the basmala, basmaltu, you can say basmaltu, and then, it, and then you can put it in the, in the forms and carry through the meanings. So you have basmaltu and so in subhana, that he said subhanallah, wa uh, hayyala, he said, he said, yeah, he said hayyala al-fala, and hamdala that he said, that he said, Alhamdulillah. The, these, this is ishtiqaq, ishtiqaq al-kubbar, another form. So these are the four forms uh, of ishtiqaq that exist in Arabic. And you can see here how they're all, in, uh, how, how meaning and it is carried in the, in, in, in the roots of the letters, these units of meaning. Now, if we return once more to the hadith which we started with the discussion, which I said, the final sentence, draws to the concept of sila, the connection, and the need to maintain connection, uh, uh, connection and link that stretches from family and also the connection from the links to the mercy of Allah. 
the common feature is that these derivatives of what we're seeing here is linked established between is established between the words the concepts and the meaning this oh yeah this is um the uh, the link from the hadith the words that we've seen in the hadith what did we do we went from ar-rahman allah's name and then to his his name ism because we're focusing on the name and then from that you have ishtiqab that leads to rahim but there's sila that goes all the way through for rahmah and then you have the two options either you connect or you get severed Qata. Yes. And if you if you sever, then you're severing all the way right up to Allah. And if you maintain, then you're maintaining with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the common feature is the sila, connecting. Now, speaking as we do a different language, it is hard for our minds and our brains to fully appreciate the links and benefits uh, cognitively available to a speaker of Arabic, a person who spoke Arabic from their childhood. However, um, there is there are encouraging um, things to consider to bear in mind is that if you remember the difference between um, what we emphasized a brain centric view of ourselves we needed to replace the brain centric view of ourselves with what with a soul centric view of ourselves that the human being is a soul centric being it's not brain centric it's soul centric yes the brain has an important role to play but essentially, we are that we, we are the thing that makes us special is our soul. So we're the soul-centric view, um, and yes, and that, and our brains might be formatted by our mother tongues, uh, whatever first language you spoke. Your brains might be formatted by that, but your souls are formatted by a conversation with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, who said to us, "Arrest the Rabbikum." We said, we said by that. When Allah asked us, our souls is formatted with a conversation that in uh, that we made we, we, we have, that Allah is asking us in Arab in this world. This is why we reveal what Allah to the Rabbi that you, you you we have spoken. So to connect with these meanings with our soul, the possibility is still there, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is making it very clear. He's telling, telling us in the Quran and Arabian, Arabian that we have made this Quran an Arabic Quran so that you might think, you might understand, so you may, you, you may know your aql, your, your aql may, may come may come alive thinking. And in another verse, he says, The first one was in Surah Al Zukhruf. Verse 3 and Surah Yusuf, Inna anzilnahu Quran and Arabian, la'allakum ta'kidun. That we have, we have revealed it as an Arabic Quran so that you may have aqad, that you may understand, you may have understanding. So we are able to understand if we engage. Now, for most of us, our mother tongue is, of course, English, but that does not prevent us from learning these words and these meanings. From uh, And for, it does not prevent us also from practicing the use of them in speech. There are lots of words we can use. And I'm sure you must have heard about the knowledge. Um, have you ever heard about the knowledge and the effect it had on the brain? The knowledge? Yeah. This was a in the days before GPS. Um, London taxi drivers um, had to learn something known as the knowledge, which was all the streets and names, of, I think 23,000 names of the streets of London in order to get the license for, as a taxi driver. Yeah, so they, they conducted um, tests on their brains before they started to learn, the, the, take the, to study the course, and when they finished. And what they found is that um, by studying that, it, it had an effect on their brain. The, the structure of their brain changed. They had structural changes in the brain by studying. Uh, 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 and this, this was observable uh, physical structure, the, it, it, the, uh, especially in, in an area of the brain called the hippocampi. Um, it, it, it enlarged. Um, so, uh, uh, this is, of course, evidence for brain plasticity, and we might not be able to speak in Arabic, but that does not stop us from using Arabic words. And the more we use it, the more it will have an effect. And we are seeing that there is effect, and the effect that we have, uh, so we can use Arabic phrases. And the important thing is to use it instead of 
saying, you know, peace be upon him. I don't know who created this. This, this doesn't come anywhere close near to Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When we say the name of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then we should say the Arabic. Say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's the dhikr of Allah, the name of Allah in this. Peace be on him means nothing of, com, com, compared to this. So, we, we, you should say, uh, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with the dhikr. Have you ever seen two old uh, uh, Arabs meeting up and, uh, and, and when they say salam to each other? Uh, how, how it goes? Uh, I saw two old Sudanese uh, uncles, you know, meeting each other. And it went on for about five, six minutes, seven minutes. You know, uh, how are you? How, uh, how are you? How the family? How the, and kept, and you know, the, the questions were all, um, and, and, and in every response, there was the name of Allah. Dozens and dozens of times, the name of Allah. And what we're talking about, this silla, is going back to Allah. This is where the silla is. This is where the, 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 the thrust of the connection is, is back to Allah. And we can hear them saying the name Allah, the name Allah. Oh, Alhamdulillah, Hayyak Allah, Barak Allah, Alhamdulillah. You know, how was your, how was your family? How was it? And the name of Allah dozens and dozens of times in our conversation. So we need to try as much as we can to adopt these syntax in our mentioning the name of Allah. Allah's name and words that link our minds to Allah, to Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. But keep and also فَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ آثَارِ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ And with our eye, with our mouth, with our, with our language, the mention of Allah, keeping Allah in mind. And with our eyes peeled on seeing the mercy of Allah. Our eyes, our eyes peeled on perceiving and observing the major mercies, the subtle favors of Allah and thanking Him for it. Asking for forgiveness over the neglect of not noticing His mercies. Um, not noticing... His mercies unfolding, His mercies uncovering, uh, of, of covering us and enveloping us and protecting us in every moment of our fragile lives in this fleeting existence of ours on this temporary planet. Now, from what we have discussed, there are two action points that you can benefit from. The first is to set yourself a target of taking on more Arabic words with their meaning. So you can set yourself at least two words a day. I'm going to learn two more Arabic words every day. Um, and if you do that, um, make a list and keep revising it. And as they become more solid, then you try to use them in sentences. In a year, you will learn 700 words. If you do that, two words every day, or oh, right, over 700 words, um, you will learn. Now, what does that do? You know how much words you need to communicate with everyday conversation in any language? How, much you, how many words do you need? You need between a thousand to three thousand. That's it. And you can communicate easily. And if, you, if it goes over four thousand, uh, up to ten thousand, then you're a native speaker. Yeah. That's how quickly you can do it. So it's not hard, especially when there are so many benefits to learning this language the language of Qur'an, the language that Allah has revealed his final message for us. The important thing is to use it, because with language, the principle is use it or lose it. This exercise will use your, will engage your left and right hemisphere, inshallah, uh, and develop stronger connections across your right and, and left hemisphere. And the next thing is that to improve, remember we talked about the logical side, you're learning the words and everything, but we talk about prosody as well. Prosody is the, the flow of the language, the sound of the language, the melody of the language. To engage with that, and there is no better way of engaging with that than to engage with the Qur'an with Tajweed. To learn Tajweed. If you learn Tajweed, you're learning prosody. You're, you're, you're getting into that. So it, these are uh, patterns of function. And of course, Ramadan is quickly approaching. Um, so you should set yourself. So these are two targets. To, to learn more Arabic, learn words that you can use. Um, and, and then set yourself with the melody of the Qur'an. Try to learn the melody. Try to learn the verses with the sound of the Qur'an, which is Tajweed. Which is the engage. What, 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 the, what is the meaning of Tajweed? Tajweed means Jawwada Yajawwidu. means Hassana Yuhassana. It is beautifying it. Making it beautiful. Making it perfect. To recite the Qur'an as it was revealed by Jibreel alayhi salam. 
by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam by the Sahaba. We take it all the way back to there. So to make an effort to recite Quran with proper makhari, with proper points of articulation in your mouth, and, and if you haven't studied Tajweed before, then consider it a priority. Um, this Ramadan, I will make my Tajweed perfect. I will, I will work with someone do my Tajweed, and because when letters are pronounced as they should be pronounced, then the effect on the heart and the soul. Remember, I'm talking about connecting back to the language upon which your soul is formative. Uh, connecting, connecting to that. So the, the effect is profound when, when it's perfect, when the pronunciation is perfect, when it's... So remember prosody and the whole mind engagement. The Prophet ﷺ said, لَيْسَ مِنَّا, ليس منا مَنْ لَمْ يَتَغَنَّ بِالْقُرْآنِ That he is not among us who does not chant the Qur'an, you know, read it with melody. That he's not among us. This is hadith in Bukhari. So we, 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 we should take uh, the benefit of the melody of the Qur'an. And remember what we said about conversation embedded in our souls also. That if you want to rekindle that conversation, then work on your and and then on your tajweed on the other. Zayyin al-Qur'an bi Now finally, to come back to the idea of rahmah and sila, mercy and connection, and to reflect on the fact that if in the hadith, the second hadith we did, we did last week, which is to keep in mind this proposed sense of, you know, we talked about this sense of distance and sense of proportion, and we are, we're horrible at this, uh, so we have to make comparisons. So if 1% of rahmah, that Allah created rahmah into 100 parts and send one that is causing all of this that we're having, or every parent, every bird, every animal, every insect is acting compassionate, is acting compassionately, is acting lovingly and affectionately to its young, on the basis of this one, that for billions, that if it can be sufficient for billions and billions of human babies and trillions and trillions of offspring of other creatures in the actions of a parent, what about the remaining bits of it? Where is that? And Allah said, 99 other bits of this Rahmah. He said he has kept it for us on the day of judgment. Yes, yes. Pondering this is heartwarming. It's uh, inspiring for the heart, the mercy in a heart that Allah is forgiving. Allah is merciful. You know, once the Prophet ﷺ saw a woman who had lost her child, and he was he was ready to find. And then she saw the child. He found her child, and she picked the child up and hugged the child, hugged it close. And Rasulullah ﷺ then pointed to her and said to the Sahaba, "Ataruna, هذه طارحة الوردها في النار." Do you think that she will throw? She could ever throw her child into the fire? And they said, no, she wouldn't. And then Rasulullah SAW said to the Sahaba, Allahu arhamu bi'ibadihi min hadihi biwaladiha. That Allah is more merciful, and more kind, and more affectionate than this mother could ever be to her child. That Allah is to, her, to his slave, he said. But we have to be, to be deserving of this rahmah, we have to be slaves, we have to become slaves. We have to become true slaves. We have to become true worshippers through servants of Allah. When this happens, then Allah's mercy will pour on us. And inshallah, we will be enveloped on the day of judgment with Allah's mercy. Affection for the mother. No affection of a mother or a father can meet the affection and the love that Allah has for us. But we have to make ourselves deserving of it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala envelop us with his special rahmat, with special mercies, and restructure our minds and hearts to observe and recognize his subtle mercies that surround us night and day. Let us pray. Allahumma waj'al al-Qur'an bi qulubina wa li absarina jila wa li asqamina dawa وَلِذُنُوبِنَا مُمَحِّصًا وَعَنِ النَّارِ مُخَلِّصًا وَعَنِ النَّارِ مُخَلِّصًا يَا رَبِّ يَا كَرِيمُ اللهم ألبسنا به الحلل وأسكننا به الذلل وادفع عنا به النقم اللهم ذكبنا منهما نسينا وعلمنا منهما جهلنا ورزقنا تلاوته آناء الليل وأطراف النهار على الوجه الذي يرضيك عنا اللهم واجعل القرآن واللهم اجعلنا من من يحل حلالا ويحرم حراما ويعمل بمحكمه 
ويؤمن بمتشابه ويطلوه حق تلاوته اللهم واجعلنا ممن يقيم حدوده ولا تجعلنا ممن يقيم حروفه ويضيع حدوده اللهم واجعلنا من أهل القرآن اللهم اجعلنا من أهل القرآن الذين هم أهلك وخاصتك يا رب يا كريم اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون بها علينا مصائب الدنيا يا رب يا كريم oh Allah, cleanse our souls and fortify our hearts with your beautiful names and help us to observe your subtle mercies oh Allah, help us to observe your subtle mercies grant us refuge and protection from all evil oh Allah. We have gathered here today seeking your guidance, seeking your favor. We are begging for your forgiveness. We are repenting from all sins. We are here seeking your love, your grace, with hands raised as beggars do. We are all beggars and we are begging you. We are begging of your kindness. We are begging of your love. We are begging you for your forgiveness. Oh Allah, you are the most kind. You are the most merciful. Do not turn us away empty handed. For if you were to turn us away, we have no other to turn to. We have no one but you, O oh Allah. You alone can help us. You alone is our savior. We have no protection except you. Protect us and protect our brothers and sisters suffering around the world. And especially in the land of Al-Aqsa, land of Masjid Al-Aqsa. O oh Allah, our destitute, our destitute, hungry brothers and sisters, our children, our mothers, our fathers, our elderly, our sick, are suffering immense pain and torture at the hands of those who have lost our sense of compassion and humanity. With these weak hands and these aching hearts and these tearful eyes, we beseech you. We are begging you, O oh Allah, help them. Help our brothers and sisters, O oh Allah. O oh Allah, you are Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. اللهم رحمك رحمك في أطفالنا اللهم رحمك رحمك في أمهاتنا يا ربي يا كريم اللهم رحمك رحمك في ضعفائنا اللهم إليك نشكو ضعف قوتنا وقلة حيلتنا وهوانا على الناس يا أرحم الراحمين أنت رب المستضعفين اللهم فرج هم المهمومين ونفس كرب المكروبين وقد الدين عن المدينين يا ربي يا كريم اللهم واشفي جميع مرضى المسلمين اللهم اشف جميع مرضى المسلمين يا رب يا كريم ربنا ظلمنا انفسنا وان لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم وتب علينا انك انت التواب الرحيم يا رب يا كريم يا رب يا كريم سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين امين Allah, 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 Allah.